All right, welcome everyone. I'm Suzanne Bontempo, Program Coordinator for Our Water, Our World, joined by Charlotte Kanner. Uh, we are IPM advocates and educators for the Our Water, Our World program. And tonight, in partnership with the Alameda Countywide Clean Water Program, we're presenting Setting Gardens Up for Success. Very excited about this topic. We will go through slides for a little under an hour. And then we'll leave time for your questions at the end. And what we're going to uh, review or what you're going to learn is first, we're just gonna provide an introduction to the Our Water, Our World program. Then we're going to briefly discuss what is integrated pest management. Then we're going to talk about building healthy soils and which plants are best for our garden and how uh, plant selection actually reduces pest problems. We're going to talk about how to plant and water correctly, um, healthy garden maintenance, and then we're just going to touch on some spring pest prevention. So the Alameda Countywide Water um, Program works to protect Alameda County creeks, wetlands, and bay from runoff that may carry pollutants into those waterways. Related to gardening, that means avoiding chemicals that can be washed off the lawn and garden into the storm drains by irrigation and rain. You can learn more about the Alameda Countywide Clean Water Program at cleanwaterprogram.org. And to sign up to get up-to-date um, information on events such as webinars like this and other in-person events throughout the county, you can sign up to get the Clean Water News at the cleanwaterprogram.org website. It's really fun and it's nice to you know, stay up to date on what's going on around the county. And uh, the Alameda Countywide Clean Water Program has a YouTube channel and there you can find a lot of really fun videos and recordings of other webinar programs, including ours. We have a, a very long list of programs that we've been providing now for what, three years, has it been? I don't know, it seems like a lot. So please uh, go check out their YouTube channel. This recording will be there. Um, it, probably by the end of Friday, if not by Monday. So yeah, check it out. We've got a lot of fun um, information there that should be really helpful and valuable for you as a gardener. And what is the Our Water, Our World program? Well, we are, the Our Water, Our World program is a national award-winning program. As of 2022, we are now statewide. Uh, we partner with water pollution prevention agencies and retailers that sell pesticides. And we provide uh, education to those retailers and to the public, um, pest management education in a way that uh, either guides you to uh, an alternative to a pesticide to solve that problem for long-term success, or just bringing awareness that there's other options that are not going to be um, pollutants that can cause a problem in our waterways. You can learn more about the Our Water, Our World program at our website, ourwaterourworld.org. And why do we care about water? So um, watersheds, our gardens, and water quality, how are they all connected? So first of all, a watershed is um, an area of land that um, any water that isn't absorbed into that soil or any snow melt that isn't absorbed in that soil, that water then moves across that land or sheds across that land to find uh, a crevice that can uh, create a stream or maybe flows into a creek, into a river. And then from there, it might flow into a larger body of water such as a reservoir or a bay, a marsh, um, then into the ocean. So that's the watershed. Um, here in California, or I should say here in um, Alameda County, uh, we're located in the San Francisco Bay watershed. So half of the water that falls on California ends up in the San Francisco Bay. So all of the water that isn't absorbed into the ground around our uh, properties or coming from those watersheds and open spaces or even within city limits, and all that water can, uh, anything that isn't absorbed into the ground can run off into the storm drains running, um, which runs through the storm drains untreated to the nearest waterway. 
taking with it any chemical pollutants, pet waste, motor oil, debris, litter, whatever else is out there in the environment. So it's important to be aware of how the products that we use around our properties can actually end up in our local waterways. And so we are here to help uh, help you find alternatives or help the public find alter alternatives, alternative products to use around their properties that won't pollute our waterways. And we do that through uh, one way um, is through integrated pest management. We like to use integrated pest management as a tool for sustainable long-term pest solutions that reduce the use of pesticide usage. Integrated pest management is a decision-making process that uses science-based strategies. It allows us to look at the system as a whole, such as the garden. And from there, we start to dive in and look a little closer and we start to ask a few questions. First, we want to understand what the problem is. Oftentimes what we're seeing are symptoms of a problem. Um, actually, the pests in the garden might be telling us something. Maybe they're showing us that the plant is stressed because the irrigation is broken and so forth. So first we really want to um, identify what that problem is. And then from there, we start to question what our threshold is and like, can we live with it? And oftentimes our threshold is much different than the plant's threshold. The plants oftentimes have a much higher tolerance of the pest problem than we do, which is kind of funny. Plants have adapted to take on some uh, leaf chewing damage, no problem, but we're the ones that freak out and go, oh my gosh, that leaf's been chewed. So that's just something to be aware of. But with integrated pest management, we always uh, want to look at how we can prevent those pest problems from happening. Then we want to uh, always identify what that pest problem is, because if we can't identify it, we won't be able to uh, solve that problem. And then from there, if we need to take action steps, the action, or if we need to take action, the action steps in IPM are called controls. We want to you, uh, look at cultural controls, which is increasing the health of the garden. We're gonna uh, look at mechanical controls, which is the tools we use to manage the pests. We're gonna look at um, biological controls, which is inviting in living organisms, such as beneficial insects to manage the pest problems. And then uh, we are going to use the chemical controls. Those are the pesticides, but we're always gonna use them as a last resort when we've exercised all the other options we're always gonna choose eco-friendly and we're always gonna use them as at a minimum. All right, and today we're gonna to mostly focus on those cultural controls and prevention actually, that's really what we're focusing on today. Sometimes those there's a big overlap between prevention and cultural controls, bolstering the health of the garden. So that's what we're gonna do talk about today is how we can set our gardens up for success, get ahead of any pests by having the healthiest plants and, and garden ecosystem as possible. So this is kind of our agenda for the first section or for most of this presentation today. We're gonna to talk about building healthy soil uh, and how to do that with organic fertilizers and mulch, choosing the right plant for the right place, uh, food crops, rotating them and other things to keep in mind when planting food. Uh, watering, how to water our plants, and healthy garden maintenance, which is all part of uh, having healthy gardens from the ground up. And as I mentioned today, we're going to start with building healthy soil, compost, organic fertilizer, and mulch. So what, let's first talk, what is soil? Cause uh, some people, I don't know, just it's better to understand what we're dealing with, what we're talking about when, before we dive in any further. So what is soil? It is made out of four components, uh, 45 or so percent mineral particles, 25% air, 25% water, and 5% organic matter. Um, now, obviously, those are all flexible and they change throughout the, the you know, weather and things like that, but that's kind of generally the ideal situation. Uh, the organic matter is something that we can focus on changing. Uh, now, 5% is a good level. It can go up to 10% as well, but that's 5 to 10% is pretty much the average of what makes good soil. 
Now, um, oh, and I want to share some people ask, how do I know what's in my soil? A great way, a really easy way to figure out um, what your soil texture is, which we'll talk about in a moment, um, and how much uh, organic matter is in your soil is to take a jar, um, like a mason jar of, of soil, maybe half or two thirds of the way full, fill it with water, shake it up real good, and then let the jar sit for 24 hours and you'll see layers form and that's going to show you kind of what uh, different particles you have. So what you'll see on the bottom is sand, the sand, um, the amount of sand you have in your soil that's going to settle first on the bottom. Sand is uh, larger particles with, you know, big pore spaces uh, for air and water to move through. Then will be silt, which are medium par uh, particles, medium pore spaces, kind of more tightly packed together. And then clay is the smallest type of particle you have. Um, they're kind of flat, so they really stack uh, tightly. And there's very little space for air and uh, water to move through and roots to move through. If you have clay soil and you tried to dig a hole, you know that <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. Not a lot of space for shovels in there either. So when you shake the um, soil up, it's going to be sand and then silt and then clay. And you will see there is usually a color difference. And then the top layer, it might not even, it might actually float on the top of the water is the organic matter. And we don't have to be technical with the 5% as long as it's, you know, it's there and you'll be able to tell, <laughs> I assure you. Um, and then another way you'll be able to tell if you have healthy soil because you have a decent amount of good organic matter is looking at your soil structure. Uh, now, this is a definitely less technical, but if you are digging in your soil and it's nice and crumbly um, and loose, but not falling apart in your hands like this picture, that means you have good soil structure. It's, you know, when you go to the beach and you pick up the sand and the sand just falls right through, that's not, there's no structure in that soil. Uh, whereas clay is, you know, hard packed and um, can be, it's like almost impossible to get roots and water through it. Uh, also not good soil structure. So we want that kind of loose, but sticking together. Um, and a great way to change your soil structure. So now, as I, uh, I meant to say, when we, once we decide, we learn, not decide, learn what our soil texture is with that jar test, we'll know how much sand, how much salt, and how much clay is in it. Uh, we can't really change that. I have sandy soil. I can never change that. Uh, some people have clay soil, they are always going to have clay soil, but what you can do is change the soil structure and you can do that through bringing in compost, which is organic matter. Um, it is the organic matter that's already been eaten by bacteria, fungus, microbes, worms, and other decomposers. So adding compost to your soil, about 5 to 10% um, is going to improve your soil structure. It's going to glue together sandy particles, hold them together so water and uh, nutrients doesn't move through it so quickly. It breaks up clay particles, opens them up to allow for uh, more pores for roots, air, water to infiltrate. Compost turns your soil into a sponge. Um, it can uh, holds five times its weight in water. So it's really just, it's turning that soil into a sponge. It allows water to infiltrate easier and it holds water longer. And so it makes it available for your plants longer. Um, it also increases the bi microbiology in the soil. It is basically, you know, it's been chewed up and eaten by all these decomposers. So when you're adding it to the soil, those decomposers, uh, that microbiology, the fungus, bacteria, microbes go into your soil as well. Um, compost can even balance pH levels, um, uh, you know, depending on your plant's needs. Uh, I think I, I could be wrong, but most need either neutral or a little bit alkaline. Is that correct? Or no, or something like, I don't know. <laughs> Neutral-ish and <laughs> Suzanne can correct me. Um, and, but anyway, if you have a high or wrong pH levels, you can use compost to correct that. Uh, it also recycles nutrients. You can use the plant waste from your garden to turn back the nutrients back into your soil. It reduces the needs for chemical fertilizers and pesticides because it grows healthy plants and those healthy plants need fewer pesticides. And it also, compost can actually fight pathogens and bacteria in soil because it increases the good microbiology in the soil. 
So a few ways you can add compost to your soil, uh, mix it into your existing soil before you plant a new uh, you know, planting area. You can top dress around uh, drip line of your, the drip line of plants. So if you have perennials, you can put, lay it on the soil around the drip line of the plants, cover it with mulch or gently dig it in, water it in. Or you can make compost tea, which is kind of what it sounds like, filling a sock or some sort of thing with compost, soaking it in water, and then watering your plants with it, either as a foliar spray or as a liquid fertilizer. And then, okay, so I mentioned the bacteria and fungi and how important it is. So uh, we really want to focus when we're focusing on our health from the ground up, we are going to focus on the life in the soil. That life in the soil is necessary for your plants to grow period and to grow especially to grow healthy uh, the bacteria the fungi the microbes um, the other decomposers they break down organic material they store nutrients in the soil and they break down toxins and pollutants and actually when they're eating they're um, excreting a kind of sticky material that actually holds soil together so that's where that soil texture comes from it's all that um, that all those bacteria and fungi um, there are plants actually like cover crops that can fix nitrogen on the, it can add nitrogen to the soil, like that photo on the left adds nitrogen to the soil as it's growing. And then um, there's also mycorrhizal fungi that we really need for our plants. They actually walks into our plant roots and extends that root zone to be able to access more nutrients and more water. And something to note about all of this, the fungi, the bacteria, plants can't take up nutrients from the soil without the help of this bacteria and fungi. It's just like in our gut, we can't process food without the help of our gut microbiome. It's the same thing happening in the soil. Plants can't just eat organic matter. They need the microbes to process it for them and feed it back to them. So we wanna make sure we have healthy life in the soil so we can have healthy plants. Um, okay, so then another way to add soil health and health to our plants is to use organic fertilizers. Now, organic fertilizers are derived from organic matter, such as mushrooms, manure, compost, kelp, blood, and bone meal, and they are not derived from fossil fuels. Those three numbers on the front of the packages are always NPK, um, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, they tend to have lower numbers. That does not mean they're not going to help or provide anything for your plant. It's just uh, that they're just like uh, less intensity, I guess, <laughs> which is what we want. Um, then they do also contain micronutrients, not just those three main nutrients as well, because they come from organic materials. They have lots of other uh, nutrients in them and they are released slowly to your plants. That is key. We don't want um, high intensity nutrients coming at our plants because our plants are rare are never going to be ready for that they don't want that they want uh, nutrients released slowly to them over time so they can continue to grow at a healthy rate a little bit more about the difference between organic and synthetic um organic as i said we're well, we're feeding the soil microbiology. And as I said, the soil microbiology feeds the plant. So we're feeding the microbiology so it can break it down and provide it to the plant. It increases soil health uh, by increasing that microbiology. Um, and it prevents growth spurts. We think that, you know, growing fast is good, but it sounds good, but we don't want our plants to grow super fast. Uh, it's usually, again, it's too fast and it can stress the plant out when it's forced to grow very fast um, and it will invite pests um, and because it's stressed out and because it's pushing out lots of new growth. So organic fertilizer will also not run off into local waterways, which synthetic fertilizer can contaminate waterways. Um, and it's not gonna burn the plant, which you can unfortunately burn a plant with synthetic fertilizers. It is actually, organic is actually more economical. Maybe the, sometimes the initial purchase can be a few dollars more than the um, synthetic purchase of the same, si same size, but you actually have to use it way less frequently and your plants don't, aren't dependent on it. So if you accidentally forget to feed once in a while, 
um, it's okay. Your plant will still be healthy and um, your overall it increases the health of your plant. So you might also not need to buy any pesticides. Um, and then I just, I mentioned synthetic pesticides do stimulate new growth very quickly, which invites pests and synthetics um, are very high in salts. So over time, regular use of them can increase the salt level, salt content of your soil, which can inhibit water um, uptake. And then this is just another picture to describe the way we are feeding the soil with organic fertilizers. We're adding it to the soil. These microorganisms are breaking down those nutrients and then delivering it to the plant when the plant wants it and asks for it, as opposed to more of like a force feeding steroid situation that the um, chemical fertilizers are offering. All right, another way we can build healthy soil is to use mulch. Mulch is really any material spread over the soil surface as a covering. Um, Yes, if you do live in a fire um, prone area, you do want to keep organic mulches away within the or out of the five feet from your house. Uh, that zone, that five feet away from your house, uh, that zone right there is you do not want to have uh, any organic mulches or plant material there. But outside of that, um, you can apply mulch and it is recommended to use a organic mulch, bark, wood chips, leaves, uh, compost, lawn clipping, straw, newspaper, um, but you can also have a mulch that is made out of uh, non-organic materials like oyster shells, gravel, fabric, rubber. We just don't uh, find as many as many benefits to using um, an inorganic material. It's all about that organic material. And uh, those benefits that we get from that organic mulch um, is that it helps with water infiltration. It, when that rain or irrigation comes, sometimes um, soil is, if the soil is already dry, it can actually repel water, be hydrophobic. So um, mulch is gonna kind of slow that rain or that irrigation and keep that soil from drying out. And so therefore the water actually infiltrates much easier. Um, it reduces evaporation, a nice thick layer of mulch on top of the soil uh, will reduce your watering needs and prevent evaporation. It regulates soil temperatures, so keeps the soil cooler in the summer and warmer in the winter, um, which is very helpful to the plant roots. They do not like those temperature swings. And then it reduces soil compaction and erosion, so my nice mulch pathways, you can walk on them and you're not compacting the soil as much and it holds um, the soil in place um, as well. So it doesn't kind of run off. And um, it also, additionally, it prevents weed germination and as it breaks down, it feeds the soil and it can actually provide habitat for beneficial insects as well. All right, so which plants are best for your garden? Plant selection for garden health. So it's really important to always follow the plant, the right plant in the right place mantra. I'm sure you've heard it before. We've said it before. We've learned it from our teachers and a lot of, uh, yeah, garden, everyone in the garden industry is always chanting right plant, right place. It's very important to do your homework and to follow this. We always want to uh, match uh, the match plants to the condition of the garden to keep them from being stressed and susceptible to pests and matching the mature size of the plant to the space available. So if we only have a space that's three feet wide, we really wanna make sure the plant that we're adding to that space is going to have a maximum growth width of let's just say two and a half feet. Uh, three feet might even be too much because if that's the space, we want to make sure we're not going to overcrowd when we want to avoid a lot of excessive pruning. When we're pruning regularly, we're actually stimulating a lot of new growth, which is going to attract pests, uh, similar to what Charlotte just mentioned, but also regular pruning um, can actually cause stress to our plant, which then can um, reduce its lifespan. 
We're always going to group plants by their needs once established. And what that means is um, full, like we're going to plant all the plants that like full sun, regular watering in the same area. And then the plants that want part sun, part shade, but will take less water once established, they'll all get grouped together in the same area as well. So we're kind of grouping the plants by their needs throughout the garden. And we always want to plant correctly, which Charlotte will get into in a moment. We're going to choose climate appropriate plants. Um, we have just come off of a significant rain, uh, but here in our California uh, Mediterranean climate, we are um, accustomed to getting uh, wet winters and dry summers. Now, maybe not as significant as what we just experienced, um, which we are now starting to experience extremes where um, we're getting wetter winters and drier summers. So more of a reason why it's so important to choose California and Mediterranean native plants that can adapt to our summer dry climate and can handle those uh, rains in the winter times or periods of having drier winters, okay? So that's really important. And when possible, we wanna choose pest and disease resistant varieties because that will also, uh, they will also thrive in our garden and reduce the pest numbers. And when possible, I'd like to invite you to please consider uh, plants that support the complex food webs that surround us. It is so important to not only plant uh, things that we think are beautiful, but then are also going to offer uh, food and habitat resources for the uh, overall ecology of the garden. And if you enjoy growing food as much as I do, there are some suggestions we have that can help keep a healthy garden that is water wise and pest free-ish grow heirloom varieties. These are ideal for our California climate. They are typically more drought tolerant and they're water savers because their root systems are typically deeper divers. And um, when we can plant these uh, heirloom varieties, they're going to be less prone to pest problems because they adapt so well to our climate. And it is really important to um, Rotate, rotate our annual food crops. Um, there's a lot of information on the internet about uh, basic crop rotation that, uh, or please feel free to reach out to Charlotte and myself after the program. We'd be love to uh, dive into this more, but please just trust us that it is so important to rotate those uh, food crops, uh, which is crucial for soil health. It is also crucial for uh, balancing the nutrients in the soil and reducing or eliminating pests and diseases. So um, I know that some of us, it's very challenging if we have that one sunny spot, we like to grow that one tomato. Well, um, year after year, that can be uh, problematic. Um, so just try to do your best to rotate crops as, um, as best you can. All right, so once you've chosen your plants and you're ready to put them in the ground, we need to talk about how to plant them and how to water them. So we are going to remember that when we buy plants at the nursery, they are in very tiny pots. They're usually too big for their pot to begin with. So we need to help them expand and grow that root system. It's all about the root zone when we're first putting a plant in the ground because that's where that's where our focus should be. Um, so what we want to do when we are putting something in the ground, we're always going to um, uh, dig a hole that's deep enough where the existing root ball will sit on the bottom of the solid the solid ground, uh, but then widen it um, and and add soil so that it can allow it to the roots to go out. Um, and then it will make itself down as well. But we don't want to plant the, the plant too deeply. That's the goal with putting it on solid ground. You always want it a little bit higher up than the soil. You'd want the crown of the plant a little bit higher up than the soil surface. So there's no pooling of water at the crown. So you're going to take the, um, you're going to make sure you score the uh, roots on the outside um, just to kind of start them up, initiate them, uh, will help them expand outwards, and then you put it in the soil, um, and then we'll plant a nice wide hole, and then you can go to the next slide. 
Um, and then for bare root, fruit trees, roses, perennials, you're going to, they're going to come out, they're going to arrive with no soil. So you're going to want to um, put them in the ground at the height where the crown, again, is a little bit higher than soil level. Um, so again, we're not burying it. And then we're going to fill in that area underneath the root system, the soil cone. Uh, make sure it's nice and um, not densely, solidly packed, but we do want it full so that there's no air pockets in there. And then once that's nice and uh, full, then we can put soil on top of those roots and fill it in to make it nice and level. And then we're going to remember that even plants that are water tolerant or a drought tolerant, sorry, or uh, California natives or need less water, uh, all plants, including those, do need more water uh, when we're first putting them in the ground as they get established. And it can take some plants, uh, you know, smaller plants, six to 12 months to become established, perennials, shrubs, or yeah, shrubs, and um, larger uh, like bushes and shrubs to get established will take like one to two years and then trees will take three to five years to become established so until that point where they become established we're thinking them of them as like more like toddlers they need a little bit more guidance a little bit more help so we're going to make sure that their uh, roots and their root zone gets a, more water than they would need if they were established or adults, <laughs> which is what the tag says. So the tag on the plant will say how much water it needs once established as when it's like fully in the ground and settled. But until that point, we're going to have to continuously uh, make sure that uh, it doesn't, um, well, we don't want it soggy, but we want to make sure that it is well irrigated. And then we're going to use that water also to help our plants grow deep roots as well. So we wanna make sure that when we are watering, we are watering deeply and we are watering not just at the base, the crown of the plant, we're gonna water that whole root zone. Uh, it's really um, important to think of like when you're, when you have a plant, uh, think of it like mirror image upside down upside down in underneath the soil, that's basically how big the root zone is. It's actually probably smaller than how big the root zone is. The root zone is usually bigger than the above ground parts. So think about that. If you have a two foot um, shrub, you're gonna make, you, the roots are at least two feet under the soil. So we wanna make sure that when we are watering, we are reaching a significant portion of those roots. We're not just gonna sprinkle on the surface, that water will immediately dry or and evaporate. So we wanna water deeply and then less frequently. We do want that water, uh, that soil surface to dry out between waterings. And then at, at, if we go for watering at the crown, we are going to, I'm sorry, at the drip line, not the crown, <laughs> we are going to help those roots expand out and down as well. So, and then remember, um, as the plant grows, the watering area grows as well. Uh, so the drip line grows and expands. So if we've used something like drip irrigation or soaker hose, we're going to want to adjust that as the plant grows. So this picture, maybe, well, I don't know if this tree was ever that small, but um, maybe this was planted very early on or uh, installed very early on. And the irrigation drip line is right at the crown of this plant. But what we need to do is move it out as the plant grows so that the roots, the outer roots are actually getting the water and not the, and we don't want to have the crown of the plant uh, buried or soaked and invite any uh, lots of moisture there because that will invite diseases. A great way to have consistent watering and effective deep watering is to set up an irrigation system. And these can be really simple. Um, they can just attach to your hose and turn on the hose, or they can be much more complex that, you know, have Wi-Fi to your phone and uh, <laughs> set up different zones and things like that. But they can be really simple. But using irrigation systems with uh, controllers is going to be really effective because it's going to turn on for a certain amount of time that will allow for deep watering. And you can also have it turn on for like 4 a.m. to 6 a.m., which is the best time to water um, because that's going to be 
early when the soil and the air is nice and cool. It's going to allow for deep watering with no or very little evaporation, and then it'll allow the plant to dry out during the day, um, which is what we want. So if you have ir irrigation systems, highly recommend. Uh, they'll make your life easier and your plants will get consistent water, but you do want to make sure that you are still checking your system regularly. They um, can get leaks, uh, rodents can chew on them, um, and then also change them throughout the season. Uh, in the winter time, we may be able to turn them off completely or set them to uh, water less frequently. And then of course, in the spring, summer, we might need to increase that as well. So they're not set it and forget it. We do need to adjust them and we need to consistently check to make sure there's no leaks and the water is actually getting to where we want it to go, especially as the plants are growing. And you can check with your um, uh, county to see if there's rebates as well uh, for smart controlling controllers or uh, drip rebates. And then another thing to check, uh, maybe you're installing the irrigation system or maybe you're having a gardener um, do it. Either way, you do wanna understand the system and you wanna understand how much water is flowing out. There's a few different kinds of emitters when you're using a drip system. Um, there's inline, uh, there, there's the irrigation emitters that drip at the end and then there's the inline emitters as well. And you uh, wanna know how much water is coming out of there uh, so you really know how much water your plant is getting in a certain amount of time. And you'll be able to, you can talk to the, uh, the wherever you buy your irrigation system, they can help you. It's how many, you know, it depends on how, how many water, how many emitters, sorry, there are uh, that will help guide you to understand how much water is coming out. And also, uh, you know, unfortunately, we're not going to be able to tell you how much water you need in your yard for whatever plant you're planting, um, because it depends on a lot of factors. Uh, how much, you know, what kind of plant it is, how old it is, how, you know, how um, established it is, um, how the texture of your soil, clay soil versus sandy or loam soil does require different uh, not kinds of watering, um, frequencies or styles, I guess, of watering, you could say. Clay requires more pulsing of water, so a small, um, less time more frequently. Um, and then sandy soil, the water moves much faster through it, so you might have to water more frequently. Also depends if there's a layer of mulch covering your soil, which of course I do recommend if you want to make your watering very efficient. And then of course the microclimates of your garden, if you have sun, shade, wind, um, slope, all can affect how you water as well. And then we're gonna look at healthy garden maintenance. Um, we're going to remove any food crops from last season if you haven't already. If you still have any fruit on those deciduous trees like persimmons or apples, uh, pears, it's really important to uh, remove those. Uh, if we've got any fruits or foods, uh, crops that are still on the ground, we wanna remove those. And the main reason is because uh, there are some pests that will overwinter in the, the fruiting parts of our plants, such as codling moths. We want to make sure we've taken, uh, picked up all the fruit, all the food crops that are older, and we wanna just clean those areas uh, because we also don't want to attract other pests like uh, rodents, yellow jackets, um, skunks, raccoons, and other critters. So this, this is something that is we hear about all the time, and it's a real thing. We also want to dispose of any diseased leaves or branches or plant parts. We really want to get them off site, and we want to place them in the green waste bin so that it can go to the municipal compost. Um, it's just not a good idea to compost them at home because typically our compost systems are don't get hot enough for long enough. And then um, we want to also remove any leaves or debris from the crown of the plants. So the base of the plant, um, especially after uh, a lot of winds and stormy weather like we've experienced, you'll notice that there's a lot of like debris buildup in the crown of those plants. It's always a good uh, idea just to 
rake around or remove those branches or the debris, those leaves, just to open up the crown. That crown always wants to have nice, clear, clean, um, open airflow. And then we want to uh, selectively prune plants according to their plant needs, which we're gonna briefly talk about in a moment. Um, we're gonna check the irrigation systems for leaks and breaks um, or for any plugged emitters or plugged clogged sprinkler heads. This is important, you know, I don't think we've had to turn our uh, irrigation systems on yet, but when we do, we do wanna make sure they're all working properly. We do wanna monitor for pest activity. We just wanna, you know, actively, you know, be active with our garden and pay attention. And then we do wanna address those pest and irrigation problems once we see them. That is really important too. So pruning. So when um, we prune our plants, depending on the plant uh, and its needs, we will prune differently, uh, maybe during different times of the year. So um, I thought this illustration from uh, the spruce.com was really uh, very clear, very comprehensive for when we do our pruning. Um, sometimes we have to be careful because we are in California, which with a different climate. So we want to adjust um, maybe East Coast or Midwest publications or um, articles that we read to our climate. But um, Seems like you know we can kind of figure that out with some ease. Um, mainly, what we're probably doing right now is going around and pruning uh, our perennials, cleaning up our garden. Um, this is uh, our perennials are going to be divided into two categories. One is going to be the herbaceous perennials. Um, herbaceous plants are the non-woody plants where above um, the ground. Um, the plants will either completely or partially die back uh, throughout the winter months. Um, they may have roots, tubers, rhizomes, or bulbs underground, which allow them to survive. But um, this non-woody characteristic differentiates them from trees and um, bushes. So here is a sedum that I have, and I cut down the branches. You can see inside um, the so you see the new growth pushing at the base. Um, the branches, the picture on the left, those are the branches from last year's blooms. On the right, I did start to prune them. And you'll start to see that there's actually those canes, those branches are hollow. So I like to leave them to be about um, 10 to 12 inches tall. So um, because many of our native bees, the first that are going to emerge in the late winter, early spring are now looking for a place to nest, to put their um, plate, a place to place their eggs. And these um, hollow stems are ideal for that. So I try not to cut them all the way down at the ground. Um, I know maybe in some areas of your garden, you do have to make everything perfectly clean and tidy, but other areas of the garden, I invite you to leave things a little taller to uh, allow spaces for our native bees to nest. And then, Woody perennials is the other category. This includes also trees and shrubs, um, no matter what their size or proportion. So woody perennials can increase in both height and width. So as they grow, um, which will provide them with the strength and support of the new wood each year, so to speak. Um, and their new, um, I'm sorry, their uh, framework work of the plant is covered with bark. Sometimes it's thick, sometimes it's thin. Um, it's going to really deter be determined or, you know, um, be different from plant to plant. Um, so some are actually considered semi-woody because they aren't quite as woody as a tree or a shrub, you know, so some might have softer bark, so to speak. But examples could include a vines like a climbing hydrangea and wisteria or shrubby perennials um, and herbs such as like rosemary, lavender, and some salvia. So that might um, be familiar for you. And really what we wanna do is we never wanna cut back more than a third. And with the lavenders, it's a really great, um, um, the rule of thumb is to really prune it back right after the mass bloom has occurred because in our Bay Area climate, we can typically get three blooms each year when we're pruning it in that fashion. 
We want to deadhead to um, increase flower production. So understand that plants, when they flower, their whole purpose is to reproduce. So uh, flower is going to grow. It's going to get pollinated. It wants to then go to seed. And then those seeds want to get um, delivered throughout the garden. That's how it reproduces itself. But for us, because we love those flowers so much, we just want to see more flowers. So uh, what we want to do is we want to deadhead, which is just cutting um, that plant, that stem down to where there is a node or another branch. Um, we're going to cut it um, just slightly above where that fork is or where that branching happens. Um, we don't want to cut too higher, too much higher up. I always say it looks like deer came and nibbled and we don't want it too close to that fork or that branching because we can actually invite disease. And then at some point we can cut the whole branch back. However, I'd like to invite you to deadhead through the majority of the season, but then towards the end of the blooming cycle, I really like to invite you to just let the plants, those perennials uh, finish their life cycle and go to seed because it benefits the ecology of the garden and all the wildlife that is out there. This is another illustration um, how to remove um, or deadhead when we have multi um, spired uh, kind of uh, like lavenders or some salvias. It can get kind of tricky. We always just, I'm not sure where to cut, but it's just, this is another great illustration that I found. There's a lot of great information um, on, you know, throughout the internet and on, like Sunset Western Garden Book has some great information and how to prune as well. And then um, pruning um, for our fruit trees. This one is um, really interesting for me, but I just like to share that it is really, uh, pruning is an important part of maintenance when we're growing deciduous fruit trees. Uh, well, all deciduous trees, but primarily deciduous fruit trees on our within our landscape. So stone fruits like peaches, plums, and nectarines, apples, pears, and persimmons should all be pruned during their dormant season to keep them um, healthy and to increase fruit production. If you have not pruned your fruit trees yet, it's not too late, okay? Um, but I just wanna share, it is so important to prune fruit trees for several reasons. First, we wanna open up those canopies um, so that the branches can receive more sunlight. We wanna really make sure it's even all the way around. Um, more sunlight, um, the more sunlight the branches get, the better the fruit production will be, okay? Second, it helps reduce diseases. Uh, by opening up the canopy and more sunlight and air, um, more air is allowed to move through that canopy and it's gonna dry out moisture uh, quicker. It's also going to decrease some pests um, because there's more airflow, okay? Pests don't really like the airflow. They like to be tucked into, um, some pests like to be tucked into um, dusty kind of contained environments. And then um, next, uh, keeping the tree short, so that we can always reach all the fruit around the tree for easy harvest. So these are really important. Um, the days of having a big lollipop tree in our backyard, that's a little bit of an old fashioned um, ideology. It's really important to prune your trees short enough that we can um, access all the fruit. And the Dave Wilson uh, website, the Dave Wilson Growers um, has a lot of great information on how we manage fruit trees in our, for our home garden. All right, so um, that was kind of all how to set up our gardens for success, um, things to think about, uh, building healthy soil, watering, planting, maintaining our gardens. And now since we are approaching, well, we are in spring, uh, we're just gonna talk a little bit about spring pest management, what to expect and how to prevent some pests. First, uh, proper identification is key. Uh, we want to, um, always identify the pests before we, you know, try to do anything about it. Um, these, you know, these photos show a monarch butterfly caterpillar, which is obviously something that we want around and we want to help nurture. Um, but then it also looks very similar to the white line sphinx caterpillar and some other caterpillars as well look very similar. So again, we want to identify what we're looking at. Is it a good bug, a bad bug? And if it's a pest, you know, what exactly is it? All lots of different pests require different management strategies. We're gonna understand the life cycle of that pest, the habitat and timing, um, you know, 
when's the best time to uh, manage it and how to manage it in certain life cycle stages. Where am I going to find that pest likely? And when am I going to find that pest likely? And uh, what natural enemies does it have? Can we I look for those in the garden as well? And if so, I'm going to let them kind of do their thing. And then again, another example of identification being really important for uh, understanding how to deal with an issue. So say we have a, uh, a peach tree and it has these funny looking leaves, a little curly. Um, one, it could be aphids uh, that do suck juices out of the leaf and curl the leaf, or it could be peach leaf curl, which is a fungal disease. We treat aphids and fungal diseases very differently. And of course, if it's a plum tree and it has curly leaves, it's not going to be peach leaf curl because plums don't get peach leaf curl. So again, understanding what we're looking at and it can help us, like what kind of plant we're looking at can also help us identify the pest as well. Um, and we want to understand that some pests are seasonal and expected. Aphids are a great example, always in the spring, actually kind of all year round, but more so in the spring when the new, uh, when the plants are pushing out new growth, we are going to expect them. Um, and we are going to understand though that pests are food for beneficials. Beneficial insects spend, uh, they come into our gardens, they, they can be predators eating pests, they can parasitize pests as well. So if we have no pests in the garden, we're not going to have anything for those beneficials. So kind of reevaluating our thrust thresholds, as Suzanne brilliantly mentioned at the beginning, our plants have much higher thresholds for pests than we do. Uh, most plants can withstand a, a pretty solid level of aphids. As long as we're focusing on all the things that we already talked about, the health of the plant, uh, aphids should be no problem. And then understand with that same reason, an infestation of a pest is a, can be a clue that something is not working with that plant or that plant is stressed. And if you address that cause, then we can manage more easily manage the pest as well. Um, and then also, yes, have you noticed that certain pests are on one plant and not the other? Uh, this is, <laughs> Suzanne loves this picture of a rose infested with aphids uh, because that rose was not being well taken care of and it had been a not good spot for it. So it was naturally infested with aphids. Um, so yeah, understand many uh, pests are host specific. Uh, you're going to likely, you know, if you're going to plant kale and cabbage, you're most likely going to get cabbage moth, but they're not going to bother your green beans or something like that, your different or your tomatoes. Um, and then certain plants are more stressed. So that's where the pests go as well. And then a lack of beneficial predators can also be a clue uh, or could be a reason why you have so many pests as well. So we're probably, we're in the midst of dealing with weeds right now. So much rain has brought so much weeds. Um, the best way to manage weeds, unfortunately, is with our hands or with tools, physical tools, manually managing them. The earlier, the better. Uh, the, as soon as they first emerge, they're not as strong. We can easily hoe them or uh, disrupt them or pull them. Um, but of course, it's not too late. Even if it's, you know, they're more established, that's okay. We can use a line trimmer or a mower to get um, to knock them back or cut them down. Uh, just make sure that we are not trimming or mowing after they go to seed. We want to do all of this disruption before they go to seed to reduce spreading more seeds around as well. So, the, but, you know, the earlier, the better, the more consistent, the better. Uh, over time, if we're consistent with disrupting the weeds, cutting them, mowing them, pulling them, smothering them, it will eventually lead to fewer weeds. I know it sounds very hopeless at times, so it feels very hopeless at times. And a great way to um, manage weeds as well, especially in like a really large area that you're not necessarily doing much with or you are gonna plant in, uh, sheet mulching is a great way to smother the weeds and you don't have to pull them. You can just kind of cut them down um, or not. Um, hopefully 
as long as they haven't gone to seed, and then you're going to layer several layers of cardboard on top of either the lawn or the weeds or just the bare soil. And then you're going to add um, mulch on top of that, several inches of mulch on top of that. Now you can add cardboard, uh, not cardboard, compost either under the cardboard or above the cardboard as well. That is up to you. Um, but this is going to help with um, smothering whatever is underneath it, regenerating soil, the cardboard and the mulch is gonna break down and add nutrients to the soil and it will defend against weeds um, over the long term without having to do a lot of physical management. And then some spring pest prevention tips. Things that we are going to expect are, or if they're not already present, are snails, earwigs, and yellow jackets, um, gophers also, <laughs> um, and then aphids, of course, as well. But for snail, snails, earwigs, and yellow jackets, a great way to manage them is just with traps, physical traps. Um, and now with snails and earwigs, you can usually make your own trap at home using beer for snails, like a little sunken container of beer. Um, or earwigs can also use a sunken container with like a fishy oil um, or some sort of like, it's usually a fishy oil that attracts them. And then you can easily buy a yellow jacket trap um, with some sort of, that, that comes with like a, a lure that attracts them. Uh, really recommend getting those yellow jacket traps out early. Now is a good time, actually. Um, if we catch the queen, she comes out early. If we catch her, then the population of yellow jackets in the area will go down significantly. And then exclusion is another great way to manage, to prevent pests. Um, wire baskets both above and below the ground before below the soil surface so either dealing with birds rats um, other critters like that or underground for gopher baskets um, going to help prevent our gopher problems which the best way to deal with gophers is to prevent them <laughs> we'll say that a million times once you have them and once they're already eating your plants they're very challenging you're not you it's hard to you can't really save your plants once they've already eaten them so put all new plants in gopher baskets or line your raised beds with gopher wire. Um, and then row cover can also be a great uh, tool to keep flying insects, birds, and other things out in protecting your, uh, your garden beds. Um, I will share that pesticides are, uh, there are some great organic or non less toxic pesticides for snails and slugs and earwigs like Sluggo or Sluggo Plus. But because we've had so much rain, there is uh, the, the, the active ingredient and the, the material is just kind of like washing away very quickly. So it's not being, it's not very effective. So right now with all this rain and moisture in the environment, uh, we should really stick with traps and exclusion. And we um, don't want to forget about the flowers. We want to plant lots of flowers to attract our beneficial insects and pollinators. Though we associate the beneficial insects with eating our garden pests, they also require food in the form of pollen and nectar from our flowers. So plant a variety of flowers uh, or yeah, plant a variety of plants and flowers that grow in either small clusters of flowers like sweet alyssum, yarrow, um, Ceanothus, or flowers that look like a daisy, uh, or a sunflower, like the Cosmos, Eridron, and Clardia. We want to plant those flowers to invite our garden allies um, who support a healthy garden ecology. So these beneficial insects are really the ones that are keeping our gardens in balance. So you can think about inviting the three Ps, the pollinators, uh, such as the bees that fertilize the flowers and increase the pro um, productivity of food crops and increase the flowers as well. Uh, predators such as ladybugs who consume insects as food, reducing the population of the bad bugs. Or the parasitoids, the parasites such as parasitic wasps that use their host plant as a nursery. They use their host pest as a nursery for their young, which is really crazy. Uh, for uh, plants, uh, plant lists to find out more information about plants that support the beneficial insects around the garden, 
the plants that invite them and that will offer um, uh, nectar and pollen for them. You can see plant lists on the Our Water Our World website, our local master, UC Master Gardeners. They have amazing resources that uh, support the beneficial insects and also Cowscape. Cowscape.org is um, a really amazing resource that will offer a great list of plants that support our beneficial insects. And then um, we want to understand when we do go for a pesticide, um, well, it's a very rare occasion we actually should be using a pesticide. Um, we want to always look at reducing and avoiding pesticide usage because the pesticides don't um, they'll kill the pest, but they don't necessarily solve the problem. And not only are they killing the pest, but they oftentimes are killing the beneficial insects too. So um, though, you know, um, the pesticides work really well, but um, they're only going to offer a, a brief respite of the problem. If we haven't addressed the problem, if we haven't corrected it, those pests are going to come back and typically with a vengeance because we've also killed the beneficial insects. Some more online resources for you to uh, check out would be the Our Water, Our World website, which has a nice uh, catalog of um, fact sheets that address specific pest problems that are very user friendly. Um, and then the University of California statewide IPM um, program, their website is this massive database of really great information on pest management and um, there's like a weed cat uh, um, catalog to identify different types of weeds in the garden or wildlife uh, management and identification. It's just a really great website that has a lot of information. And for pest identification support, we can always go to bugguide.net. And then for information on how the active ingredients work on the pesticides that we use, um, I always recommend going to the National Pesticide Information Center. And with that, I'd like to thank you for joining us and we'd love to finish with your questions.